anyone who lives in London or has been in London in the last few days or even has read the newspapers about London must recognise that in this run-up to the Olympics we are moving into what has been called a lockdown society. We've got the helicopters circulating overhead, we've got, as everyone knows, the rapier missiles parked on the rooftops, not just of the council blocks, but even the private tenants blocks in the vicinity of the Olympic Park itself. We've got, and have had for many years, more surveillance cameras in London than anywhere else in the world. Um, and many of us will know that you're surveilled probably at least 14 or 15 times a day as you go through your normal business in London. So the idea that we are living in a surveillance society has actually sort of been growing on us over and growing on society almost with a degree of acceptance and uncriticism over the course of the last several years. Now, of course, it's become acute in the context of the Olympics um, when you read that there are going to be more British soldiers employed patting down people who are the visitors to the Olympics than there are in Afghanistan. That might be a better thing for them to be doing than being in Afghanistan. But nonetheless, it's an indication. It's an indication of the way in which what's been happening over the last few years is that the war has been coming home. And that is the techniques and technologies which have been developed by the Americans, by the Brits, by the French, by many other imperialist powers over the last decades to police and to militarize the outposts of imperialist expansion, whether it's the Israelis over the Palestinians, whether it's the Brits and the Americans in Iraq or Afghanistan, wherever you care to look, these technologies are coming home. And they're coming home to police our cities and to police the citizens of, the, of this country. So that's the background against which I want to talk about some of the new neural technologies which are beginning to develop at the moment. Because what we have at the moment already is a society in which um, over the last months um, the coalition government has required and is going to get away with the claim that all emails all phone calls that they wish to have access to, they can have and have, will have access to. So all our communications are already blocked and are available in that way. Of course, many of us know that's been the case for many years. Um, where I used to live up in Ilkley, um, just over the moors, there's Blubber House Moors, which has got a great set of domes which have been increasing um, despite the, um, the women who've been caravanning outside and protesting over many years now. And every single email and telephone message that, is go, that is, goes through Britain actually sort of can be accessed in, uh, in, the, in the interest of the, the United States security. So there's nothing new about that. But the idea that, in fact, sort of this is now sort of publicly legitimate policy that the government should have access to these things is something which is new and something which, um, again, seems to have been accepted without any, um, without major complaints about um, civil rights, about citizenship and everything else. But, of course, it goes further than that. Um, a very good example of going further than that and going not just at what's going on outside us but is going on inside us comes from the DNA story. Um, I think we're all familiar with the fact that the um, British DNA um, police forensic DNA bank is the biggest in the world. It contains, I think, something like 8 million different samples of DNA taken not just from people who have been convicted of crime but people who are witnesses of crime, people who are declared innocent afterwards even from children as young as 10. So this DNA record is actually there in the police data bank, and despite the EU legislation and, and ruling that in fact these samples should be destroyed, the successive governments, the Labour government and the, the Conservative government, have clung on to um, the retention of as many of these samples as possible. Now, one thing that um, the Labour government tried to do was in the interests of what they thought was perhaps um, national health, was to create a, what they called a spine. All the NHS health records would be centralized and become available so nationally in a, on, on, on a huge computer system, um, which cost many millions of pounds and was ostensibly scrapped by the Tories when they came in because the computer system wasn't working. 
Um, within a very few months afterwards, however, it was resurrected. It was resurrected in a new form in which Gabe Cameron announced that um, there is no option of opting out. Your DNA and health records are going to be maintained on a central computer record to which insurance companies, big pharma, the tobacco companies and everyone else will have access. And it's clear that he was encouraged in doing this by meeting with um, a group of some of the leading biotech figures in the, in the British economy. Um, David Cooksey, John Bell, um, and uh, several others as, 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 as well involved, and indeed, of course, with the advocacy of Lord Sainsbury, who was Science Minister during the Labour government and is now a major sponsor of, um, what's it called, that right-wing yeah, right think tank? I think it's called Progress, but I'm not absolutely <laughs> sure. Um, so the DNA records are there, coupled with the health records, which means that the intimate details of all of our personal health life and so on are now locked in and accessible to anyone who wishes to tap into the system. And the idea that a system like that is secure um, is obviously completely ludicrous. Now that's pretty much familiar ground. And I say that as a background to perhaps the less well understood things, which are, I think, just about coming down the line now. And these are developments not within DNA science, but developments within the brain sciences themselves. And the developments I want to talk about are partly about um, the availability of new forms of pharmacology, and secondly, the availability of new forms of what I'll call neurotechnology, which is machinery to do various sorts of things. And basically, they, both the chemical and the um, and that if we can call them the physical neurotechnologies, are about three different things. One is they're about reading minds, that is trying to understand what is going on inside a person's brain and mind at any given time. Secondly, they are about changing <coughs> minds, manipulating and changing them, disorienting them, doing a variety of other things as well. And thirdly, they're about enhancing minds, that is providing new technologies which can as extend the mind and brain of action outside. And I want to talk a little bit about all three of these, just to give us a background of some of the problems that we're concerned with. I think the, the chemical ones are pretty familiar to us, actually. So we're talking now about psychopharmacology, about the drugs which, which um, most of us are familiar with in various forms for most of our lives. But the drugs which are used increasingly for social control, one of the things that's happened over the course of the last few years is that it's become abundantly clear that most of the psychochemicals which are now available for um, prescribed for depression, for schizophrenia and so on, simply don't work. Um, and they have been the subject of a vast mis-selling campaign by the drug companies. It's notorious and well documented how the big drug companies at the moment, big pharma, whether we're looking at GlaxoSmithKline, we're looking at Pfizer, we're looking at Eli Lilly, any of these global big pharma companies are involved in a whole range of completely corrupt practices that involve bribing doctors, publishing false papers, misstating their results and so on. Um, only in fact last week was GlaxoSmithKline fined, this is the biggest, uh, I think the fourth biggest pharma company in the world, and the biggest one in Britain, was fined the sum of $2.9 billion by the US for the mis-selling of its drug Paxil, um, Seroxat here. It's an SSRI, and it's potentially used for treatment of depression, and it was missold for the for use with children. Um, so there's been an extensive, huge increase in the diagnoses of, um, of depression and other diseases, even in children as young as 10, fostered by the drug companies and for which these drugs are being pushed. There's been no prosecutions against GSK so far in Britain. Um, the Americans are much tougher about this sort of legislation and this sort of prosecution than the Brits are, as we're seeing, of course, in the banking scandals that are going on at the moment. So those drugs, I think, are fairly familiar to us. So too is the increasing use of drugs to um, control kids in classrooms. 
I'm talking here about, I've talked about it at Marxism before, and I'm happy to talk, uh, talk about it if anyone's particularly interested now, but I'll just mention it very, very briefly indeed. I'm talking about the increasing diagnoses of ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity, in school kids, um, and the use of um, drugs like Ritalin, which is an amphetamine-like drug, in order to control them in the classroom. Now, what we're dealing with here, as many of you know, and I suspect many of you are actually teachers and have a more, as it was, a head-on, um, face-to-face relationship with Ritalin and the drugs than I do. I can sit back and look at it like this. This was a disease condition which did not exist in Britain in 1990. At that stage, you would have spoken to a pediatrician and have been told that perhaps one in 500 kids might be suffering from what was then called minimal brain dysfunction. And there were about 2,000 prescriptions for Ritalin issued a year. By last year, there were 600,000 prescriptions for Ritalin issued each year. And the claims are that anything up to 5 or 6% of uh, school kids, mainly young boys, um, are suffering from a minimal brain dysfunction. There has been a complete explosion of diagnostic criteria like this, which is aimed essentially, I think, at medicalizing and controlling the population in the interest both of pacification and in the interest, of course, of the profit that Big Pharma can make from this. Um, when we're told that the development of the, the these sciences are about health, they're almost overwhelmingly about wealth creation. And that doesn't mean wealth creation for the population at large. It means wealth creation for the big pharma companies, the huge sums that are actually produced. In last year, at a time when the GlaxoSmithKline crisis was at its height and they were just about to be fined, the CEO of GlaxoSmithKline negotiated, was offered a um, remuneration, I think it's called, of 6.4 million. Um, he was not satisfied with this, and nor was his board, and he renegotiated an increase last year to 10.6 million on the grounds, just as GlaxoSmithKline was about to be fined this 2.9 billion, on the grounds that for a company like GSK, this was an inadequate salary. It still put him, as they said, in the lower quartile of the um, salaries for um, CEOs of big pharma companies. So there's been this huge inflation at the end there, the huge manufacturing development of a pharmacological industry and the pharmacological, pharmaceutical pacification and medicalization of, 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 of the community. That much, I suspect, um, is fairly familiar ground for many people here, so we've been talking about it for some time. So what's with the new physical neurotechnologies? And those are the ones that I want to turn to in the rest of what I want to do, just to set out the agenda that we have to discuss. Um, these derive essentially from um, the huge advances in brain science, which has come about from the development of the big scanning machines, things like um, functional magnetic resonance imaging, um, positron emission tomography, um, magnetoencephalography, and so on. Basically, what these machines can do, um, and I think everyone will be familiar with those extraordinary false color images that you can see of brains which have been taken from people going through fMRI. They ostensibly, and there are a lot of criticisms about them that I won't go into unless anyone's technically interested at the moment, they ostensibly can claim to measure which bits of the brain are active under which circumstances and in which context. Um, so in the laboratory you can do experiments in which you ask people to um, solve a mathematical problem or something of this sort. You can see a bit of the brain lighting up in this sort of way. Okay, reading the mind. The claims have been that um, it's possible therefore to use these technologies to tell, to read the mind in the sense of being able to tell whether someone is lying or telling the truth, whatever it might be. Two companies in particular um, in the US have been particularly interested in this. And at this moment, I want to introduce you to a set of initials which may or may not be familiar to you. The initials spell out the word DARPA. DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency in the United States, and it is the major funder of research in this area. Any resemblance of DARPA to Darth Vader, I think you should <laughs> 
<laughs> over decades now, they have been funding projects to, in artificial intelligence, in the uses, as we know, of the subversive uses of LSD and drugs over the 50s and the 60s in the States and so on. DARPA has been interested in the issue of reading minds, and the companies which have sprung up on the basis of DARPA research have been one called Brain Fingerprinting and one called No Lie MRI. The Brain Fingerprinting website is a particularly interesting one. It claims to be able to use um, the uh, measurement of the electrical properties of the brain in order to determine, for, and this is almost a direct quote from their website, whether a person has been to a terrorist training camp, has, has had terrorist thoughts or inclinations, or is likely to do so. <laughs> okay. That's um, pretty grotesque, the brain fingerprinting one. No lie MRI does more or less exactly the same. Um, there have been attempts already to use these technologies in, in, in courts. Um, they have been um, ruled out in this country. Um, they have been used in the United States to a very modest extent. And interestingly enough, used by Indian courts who have been trying potential um, terrorists who have come across the border from Pakistan or wherever it might be. So the claim is that you could use these technologies like the old um, fingerprinting techniques which, um, the, which, which are sort of familiar stuff of the 1950s and 1960s. I suppose the truth is, of course, that um, anyone who is trained to actually sort of avoid and deal with thoughts and worries of uh, 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 questioning of that sort will be able to control their own brain processes in this sort of way. What it does do such technologies is pick up a person who might be worried, frightened, or abused by the techniques and by the interrogators that are going on. So what you see going on here is coupled with the development of the washboarding techniques and the, all the other techniques that there are around for physical interrogation, the development of new techniques to identify and try to discover what is going on inside a person's mind. That's, of course, about trying to read minds. Um, how about changing minds? Well, again, this is something that Darwin has been interested in for a very long time. The question is, could you actually use the drugs or the physical technologies in order to disorient an enemy or to enhance your own troops? Um, well, disorienting an enemy has been around for some time. Back in the 1950s, 1960s, the US Army Chemical Corps patent, uh, developed a drug called BZ. It's a bit like LSD. And they showed some propaganda films in which troops which had been, who had been sprayed by these, with BZ in this sort of way um, sort of fell around on, uh, around on the ground laughing, threw their weapons away, buttoned up their tunics wrongly, and so on. Um, <laughs> this was supposed to be a form of non-violent use of, um, of, 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 of of chemical weaponry of this sort. And uh, not surprisingly, the US government has been, or military have been particularly cautious about trying to use something which would simply make their troops fall down in laughter. <laughs> so, but what is happening is that over the last decades, there has been a very quietly developing research program in um, the Soviet Union, as it was then, Russia now, in the United States, in France, in Britain, to develop new classes of agents which could perform these sorts of operations. Um, the technical name for them is carnatives. The um, less technical name, as they're known by people in the trade, is on the floor or off the rocker. And you can be one or the other. We first came to, the, we, these first came to public attention oh, sort of about eight years ago now when some of you will remember there was a siege, uh, there was a hostage taking in the Nordos Theatre in Moscow, um, in which a group, I think, of Chechen um, revolutionaries seized the theatre, um, during the theatre performance, invaded it, took the entire theatre audience and, uh, as, as, as hostages. Uh, after a, a standoff of a few days, the Russian special forces, the Spetsai, sprayed an opiate-like substance, fentanyl, into the ventilation system of the theatre. Um, the results, which were supposed to be non-lethal non agents of this sort, the results were uh, um, 
disastrous. Over 130 of the hostages died. They shot, of course, all the, all, all, all the hostage takers. Um, but the idea that you can have a non-lethal agent of this sort is something which is, um, I think, a sort of fantasy which the drug companies and the military and the police have been interested in some time. There's a very interesting dividing line here. These agents are banned under international law. But although they're banned under international law, there is no law that says that you can't use them on your own civil population. So the war can come back into your own population. This is how the Israelis use them in Palestine. This is, of course, how the Russians claim they were working using them there. And most of the research on this is done under the aim of, uh, under a, poli a civil umbrella rather than under a military umbrella to get round the international conventions of this sort. And again, careful reading of the, uh, of the small print of some of the announcements from the current um, coalition condemned government uh, over the last um, year shows that they are now increasingly um, legitimizing the use of agents of this sort, CS and other agents, in civil control quotes, processes in Britain, much, of course, accelerated in the aftermath of the riots of last year. Um, so you see an increase in the legitimation and the distribution of these agents in the police forces, and of course also an interesting um, increase in the use of um, a non-chemical agent, a pacifying agent, called a taser. Tasers, which will be familiar to some of you, are fire, um, and they, they, I think they've got a range of about 15 or 20 yards. They fire a string with a hook at the end of it, um, which attaches to a person's skin or clothes, and um, administers a sharp electric shock. Two people in Britain have died over the last, young people have died over the last couple of years by being tasered by the police in this sort of way. Um, I was privileged a little while ago to visit the Home Office and inspect the new generation of tasers that they had on, on, um, on display. They're rather interesting, actually. they look like toy water pistols. They're bright yellow plastic things, so you, a policeman firing them does not actually think he's firing a dangerous, potentially lethal instrument. But they can be and are, and are being increasingly used. So that is the sort of combination of the physical and the, um, and, and the um, biochemical technologies which are coming, I think, down the road for us as um, civil unrest grows, as the policing and the, and the destruction of civil society, which has been going on so dramatically over the course of the last decades or so, increases in this country um, and elsewhere. Um, but DARPA's ideas, of course, go further than simply changing minds in this sort of way. Um, they also have been very interested for a very long time in the idea that you could actually manipulate people's minds by the use of microwave and, and, and um, a shortwave radiation. Um, if you're in my trade and write about this a bit, you get several emails a week from people who claim they've been microwaved by the US government or their thoughts are being claimed affected by the US government or whatever. Um, and you're, if you begin talking about this, you're dangerously near the terrain of the Scientologists and so on. Um, I don't want to be very clear, I'm not going in that direction. The direction I am going in, however, is to look at what the DARPA contracts are. And DARPA has contracts for um, precisely this action at a distance. At the moment, in order to read or disorient a brain, you have to be inside a machine. You have to be inside one of those fMRI tunnels. You've got to wear electrodes or headnets over your head or something of this sort. But there have been a whole series of contracts led by, led, led by DARPA. And I should say we know more about DARPA because freedom of information is a hell of a lot easier in the United States than it is here, as we all know. Um, so you can find out much more clearly what the American government is doing than what our own military and, and civil um, researchers are doing in this context. But anyhow, DARPA has, con has had contracts for a number of years to try to actually pro pro provide this dor disorienting beams of this sort. Um, they are still in the realm of science fiction. What's not in the realm of science fiction is the agents which have been used particularly by the Israeli military against the um, protesters against the, uh, the apartheid war in 
Berlin and elsewhere in, on the West Bank, um, in which they've been using something <coughs> called an active denial strategy, a technique developed by the American company Raytheon. And there are several versions of active denial strategies. One of them in, involves producing a, um, a, an incredibly loud scream sound, which actually disorients people. The second is to fire bullets people which actually produce an intense burning sensation. Um, we managed to bring back one of the containers that had been used and analyze the chemicals inside this, which resulted in very serious burns and, and, and damage to a person who hit by them. Um, and these technologies, which have developed partly in the States, partly by Israel, which of course has one of the most effective research programs and substantial research programs of this area, in the entire world um, and has no qualms about using, them, using the te these technologies against the Palestinians, you can see the way again that these arguments are going. The liaison between the Israeli military and the American military in developing these city and population control tactics, tactics has to be seen when you remember that <coughs> Israeli advisors were present in the American siege of Fallujah um, back during the course of the Iraq war. Um, so, in a sense, the tight links between Israel and the United States work both ways and to both countries' advantage, it seems, or their military advantage, anyhow. So that's changing minds in that sort of way, changing minds chemically, changing minds using these physical techniques that are around. How about the other side of it, which is improving or enhancing minds? Again, um, there's a lot of interest in the, in the military technology, in, in, among, in the military field, especially in the context of what's been going on in Iraq and Afghanistan over the last 10 or 15 years. And a lot of this is devoted towards, in, in two directions. One is, can you enhance the fighting capacity of what the, in the jargon is now called war fighters? They used to be called frontline troops or infantry or something of that sort. They're now called war fighters. And if you look again at the DARPA contracts, you find several in particular in, in this sort of way. Some of them, most of them involve having electro um, hairnets put over the head or inside the helmet of the soldier or the, uh, or, or the intelligence analyst. There's an interest, for example, in, in improving the capacity of intelligence analysts to analyze photographs very, very quickly indeed by, brain, by, by stimulating particular brain areas in this sort of way. There's an interest in also in what they call cognition enhancement. This can be done both electrically and, of course, it can be done by drugs. Um, the use of two sorts of drugs is now well established by the, in the American military. One is Ritalin, um, which you heard about a moment, a little while ago, in terms of what it was being used for in treating ADHD in schools. But it does increase attention and arousal. And the other is Modafinil, a drug originally produced by the French, which the American pilots are now using on long flight missions because it's, it um, prevents um, sleepiness keeps you awake and alert for long periods of time. So these drugs are again part of the increasingly chemical and physical armory of the, uh, of, of, of the military and of the police. Um, of course, smart drugs have an interest outside in the general population as well, and um, we can <coughs> go into that discussion if you like, because um, most of us are familiar with the claims that have been made for anything from caffeine to Italy especially when you're preparing for examinations. So um, there's a constant spin-off and interchange between the military, the civil police authorities, and the uh, and, and, and civil population and civil use in this sort of way. The other thing that has happened is the because of the increasing range of injuries of, um, as a result of the um, the, uh, the IEDs, the roadside explosion bombs for troops coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan is the development, of course, of technologies to try to deal with brain damage. One of the, um, anyone could have told them, but it took them a little time to actually sort of recognize it, is that if you're blown up by um, an IED and you're wearing a helmet or you're in a, um, a fortified vehicle, you crack your helmet against the, the side of the roof and you shake your head violently, 
Um, the result is brain damage. And an increasing number of troops are coming back from, in British troops and, and American troops, of course, are coming back from Iraq and from Afghanistan with brain damage of this sort. So um, as a result of that, there's been a considerable interest in trying to develop prostheses, again, either deep brain stimulation, magnetic stimulation, or agents of this sort, which can enhance or can improve um, brain damage. And of course, for someone who's lost their limbs, the idea that you could have a computer which was tied to your brain so that you could actually move a robot arm, a prosthesis of this sort, is something which has huge implications way outside some of the, 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 the military use as well. Um, the one final agent which I think is quite interesting, which um, the Americans have been developing and had a lot of research interest in, is this. Um, Many of the troops who come back from Iraq and Afghanistan come back horrified by their experience, shocked by it. It used to be called shell shock in the First World War and so on. It's now called post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder is... Um, it's become a very fashionable diagnosis at the moment, whatever else it is. But the idea somehow is that you could actually, if the, it's due to the recurrence of memories of the experience that you've been involved in, and if you've been involved <coughs> in nap arming, shooting, killing, cutting heads off, urinating, um, giving electric shocks to Afghani civilians, you're likely to have a lot of poor memories, quite clearly. Um, so can you erase these memories? So bizarrely, there's a whole research interest now in trying to provide drugs which will actually erase unpleasant memories. Um, it's still partly in the realm of self science fiction. It comes out of the sort of research program which I and many other people have been involved in over the years. Um, and it sort of reverses what we've been interested in, which is improving memory in the context of people suffering from Alzheimer's disease, by saying, can you devise a chemical and a, physi a physiological regime which will erase a bad memory? A few years ago, there was a film by Charlie Kaufman called Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, which some of you will remember, um, which showed a crude version of trying to erase memories of this sort, but rather clearly indicated the difficulty of so doing. So, time to stop and to sort of leave us now time for discussion of some of these ideas and issues. Um, so, just very briefly to summarise, as well as the external surveillance, which is increasing every day around us at the moment, as well as the internal, you have both the internal surveillance of DNA coming from the health service records, you have the elision of the um, military technologies used in, um, in the illegal wars in Iraq or Afghanistan or wherever it might be, into the control of the civil population in countries like Israel, in to a minor degree, but an increasing degree in this country as well. And on top of that, you've got this range of these new neurotechnologies, um, which can read minds, or are claimed to be able to read minds, to change minds, and to enhance minds. So those are the issues which I think we should be aware of and try and consider what our responses and our responses ought to be to the ways in which these programs are being developed, whether there's anything that we can do about it. Thank you very much. Stephen's meetings always fascinate me. Uh, I always come along to them because I think they're just so informative. Um, but it also scares me to death when I listen <laughs> to what they're doing to us, really. But, and I, I just wanted to say something about really the war on terror in this respect because today I read in the mirror there's a, a double page spread about the uh, threat of terror at the Olympics. Um, and it's a story about some unnamed so-called terrorist who has been in and out of the Olympic Stadium three times. And obviously, it's a justification for more surveillance. But on the other hand, it does tell you that no matter what they do, they can't stop us, can they? I mean, you think about the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. They can't win with all the technology they have in the world. They cannot stop the human condition of fighting back and wanting to resist the way in which they take away our rights. And I was thinking about the um, Ken Loach film, um, Family Life, which many people may remember, which was really about um, controlling people's minds as well. 
And I think no matter how much they do try to control people's minds, that people will always resist. No matter what new technology they bring along, um, people will find different ways around it or utilise. I was thinking about the Egyptian revolution as well. That I, I don't believe that the internet was responsible for the Egyptian revolution, but actually the internet, developed by Microsoft, developed by people with lots of money and power, actually is used to disseminate ideas that people will stand up and fight back. So I think it's interesting that that, uh, that can happen. And my final thing is that I want to say is it just angers me so much that all this money is invested in controlling our minds, keeping us down. I think there's an old uh, saying by somebody about they have to rule us by force, fraud or goodwill. And it seems to me, and I suppose it's a bit of a question really, that in the uh, age of neoliberal economics, they are now, it seems to me that they're now trying to use more and more force and fraud. And I'd be interested to, see, to know what Stephen's got to say uh, about that. But it does make me so angry that they spend billions of pounds. And you think about the millions of people who die from want of, I don't know, a drug that costs six pence in Africa, in third world countries, and yet we can spend billions of pounds on all this complete and utter nonsense trying to control people. Question about the uh, uses of chemicals within foods like uh, spartan, which is banned in most uh, countries, and the increased amount of chemicals within food, uh, and all, almost like fluoride as well, which is in, uh, not just in the water, but in a lot of other products, and the increased amount of uh, uh, vitamins in our products, and how this will affect our health and our brains in the future. So that's just a question. Uh, two things there. Before I ask the question, I just want to say though. The authorities, police, monitoring people. Uh, in the run up to the Olympic torch event in Lancaster, uh, local rocket boy talking on Facebook about yarn bombing, which is a form of knitting. Uh, that resulted in five different people being visited by the police yeah. asking, What is this yarn bombing? I <laughs> 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 also see. CCTV coverage from a local club where we had a meeting. Uh, but my question to you is you were talking about the use by the Israeli military of noises. Yeah. Um, I know that the police have used certain frequencies to control or move on young people um, in our country. But I was wondering what type of noises are these? Is it a long noise, a short noise, if it's a certain frequency, is it based on animal sounds? <laughs> um, well, I just thought like the idea of um, using uh, these new kind of neurotechnologies to change minds is really interesting. Um, I am a psychology student, so we are infiltrated at the moment with research within neurotechnology, uh, constantly being taught these new techniques. Uh, through like fMRI, and I agree there are major issues with validity with, with fMRI. Um, but whilst doing some reading recently, um, there's a new kind of uh, idea of reading minds that's coming up. Um, it's even got a name now, it's called neuromarketing, which is um, the idea that big multinational companies can now, um, instead of doing focus groups to see how effective their advertising is, they will use things like fMRI, which will give them, in their eyes, a more objective reading of how effective their advertising techniques are. I was just wondering, how far is this going to go? I mean, like, it's, it's just moving at an incredible pace. And with the, the amount of uh, graduates that are coming out of, of psychology um, with these skills um, and with the issues with working in the health service, things like neuromarketing are just going to grow and grow and grow. And it's uh, slightly worrying, <laughs> just a little bit. Okay. Uh, very often there are publicised photos of babies and children with these hairnets on having brain scans and it's all presented as very therapeutic and benign and we're going to help these children and know about it. But a lot of this work has been done with quotes, normal, healthy children, partly to, they say, to mark out what is normal. Um, and there are quite strict rules until recently, and have been for 70 years, that um, so-called non-therapeutic research, which is not a direct benefit, especially to the child's concern, should not be conducted because, and to your an adult, it's supposed you can't give fully informed consent. So, first of all, these rules about non-therapeutic research are being slid along to include a lot of 
research that might help other people in the future. Uh, that's one problem. And the other is, in theory, parents and adults should be given full information about all the implications, risks and benefits of this research, including future use. Should this include the possibilities for marketing, for the army, for police, for surveillance? If all routine brain scanning may well be used for that. Now, you said, Stephen, about ways forward. Should we be um, really uh, campaigning for the Royal Colleges, all the medical, all the doctors, all the psychologists concerned to alter their codes of practice and their research ethics standards uh, to make quite clear <laughs> where the markers are for therapeutic and non-therapeutic interventions and for proper, fully informed consent. And this would extend into training research ethics committees students and their teachers in these higher standards which we are forgetting. Yeah, um, I regret making Facebook and getting so involved in the internet because when those two people were arrested for writing a message about organising a riot and then everything happened and they got arrested for two years each or something like that, I completely lost faith in it. So I was wondering what's the most secure method of communication. <laughs> <laughs> I was found innocent of a crime like, early this year and the police took my DNA and everything and my lawyer said I had to pay him like, almost £100 to write a letter, like, a formal letter to get my DNA back. So I wrote them a letter and they said that I didn't do it properly and they, it wasn't good up properly so if anyone could help me with that. that <laughs> And I think it would be interesting to point out why I came to this discussion. I suffer with Tourette's, which is a neurological condition, and I'm the youngest man in Europe to have been treated for Tourette's using Botox at the age of 18, as Britain was the first country to use Botox. I undergo a hell of a lot of research. I'm fully aware of all the kinds of neuroimaging that you've spoken about. And I thought that would be interesting. And another interesting point, in relation to myself was, I had seven years of psychoanalysis, which is no longer available in national health. I've got OCD, ADHD, and top an eye, and look, no drugs. <laughs> <laughs> and the question I've got for a point to make, well, my point, and the question I want to ask you was, Why doesn't the British say criminalise those who break the laws as they do with the bankers? Is there a reason why they don't do this? And also, another interesting point, I was reading a book called Junkie by Aldous Huxley, and at the end, he asked, How long until you shot treatment? Um, Stephen asked at the end of his talk, what should our response be to um, a lot of this uh, neurotechnology which is, uh, and, the, and the claims of it? And I wanted to ask, surely part of our response should be a healthy cynicism about the claims that are being made. Because um, in a sense they're not new claims. I mean, uh, the ideas of brainwashing, it's a, different, it's a different sort of technology, but it was around in the 60s, you know, the idea that there were programmed assassins. Uh, you know, the Manchurian candidate, that sort of thing, uh, and it's 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 a different it's a, it's a, it's an updated version of an of an old story, and, and our understanding of the brain is much is much deeper than it was then, but it's also still very shallow in many senses. And uh, uh, what I wanted to talk about is, is is so many of these claims are based on very reductive thinking. You know, if we can only isolate the part of the brain that that causes a certain behaviour. If we can show when that's active, then we can say how someone's going to behave. There's something behind a lot of the ideas in this, uh, it, it is going on. And I think the problem is that we know the brain isn't a simple reductive organism. Uh, I, I'm learning an awful lot about a particular neurological condition at, at, at the moment. I mean, that involves not having enough dopamine. Now, you know, people talk about dopamine as the happiness chemical, but dopamine has a multitude of effects through, 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 through the system. 
one of those is to stop shaking, so I, clearly I haven't got enough dead at the moment. <laughs> if, if you can hear what I'm saying, that's good, because you can't always understand what I'm saying. There's another different effect of, of, of dopamine. There are, there are 250 symptoms of, of the neurological condition that are possible. You know, it makes it a bit difficult when you sit there reading them, and you think, which one am I, which one am I feeling today? <laughs> but well, what, what the point I wanted to make is to try and to, to say, actually, this one chemical in my brain has a huge multitude of effects throughout, throughout, throughout my body. There's no one single mechanism that you can say. We understand how, that, how it's made. It's an annoyingly simple molecule, actually. <coughs> Annoying to me uh, as a chemist. I could, if you're suffering from a lack of something, if you gave me half an hour in the lab, I could make a couple of kilos of it. <laughs> Doing me good. Uh, sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting distracted. But the point, the, the point I'm trying to make is, 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 is really, so many of these claims about neurotechnologies are based on uh, blown up claims based on reductive ideas which are very attractive but which, which really, really don't pan out and so whilst I think we should be very concerned about uh, the surveillance society and we should, we, should, we, should, we should be fighting back at every turn at the same time we should be aware that many of these claims are, 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 are overblown and, and not realistic. <laughs> Uh, I've been a psychiatric nurse for uh, 25 years and uh, you must will recognise this story. The first 15 years of my career, roughly about once a week, um, a smartly dressed fellow or woman would turn up on the ward and uh, track down the consultants and then disappear. And the following week, 70 or 80% of the, of the patients would be prescribed a new antipsychotic drug. I'm just illustrating the, the role of the drug rep. Uh, and then a colleague of mine in about 1998, he was a community psychiatric nurse, and he got a job, job as a, a drug rep. And he told me, and he made a story, that he went to see a, a medical consultant, and he said, would you take uh, my drug? And he said, well, what do you know about it? He said, well, not much, really. You probably know more than me. But if you pay for my, um, me and my two colleagues to go on a trip on a yacht for a week, then I'll take the drug. And that's the kind of thing that went on at the time. It doesn't go on so much now, but it probably goes on in much more sort of forms. So that, that's one point. The other point that's less related to the talk is uh, in the Trust's latest newsletter, uh, there's now training courses in the Trust for people like me, staff nurses, so we can uh, spot the groom, grooming of terrorists on the roads. <laughs> To that, um, I'm a child protection social worker, and there's a number in the room. And I think it's, you know, when we talk about how social work has um, been the difference between um, advocating for people in need and surveillance, it really links in because there's a sort of scientific determinism that is happening in assessment work at the moment, and we know that we focus. Uh, overwhelmingly on the poorest in society, etc. But the scientific determinism has taken on uh, a lot of the neuroscience uh, and reducted it, uh, you know, so that it sort of uh, just becomes daily mail popular psychology. That really quite specific specialists who are supposed to be assessing children's needs and uh, etc. are really taking up hugely. Um, and, you know, just one picture of a brain scan sort of proves that uh, this person, this child, hasn't had effective early years attachment. Uh, and really it's the problem, you know, the fault is of the family, the fault is of the parents. There's some, um, you know, problem in the family that needs to be sorted out. So the social issues go out of the window and you found quite major legal changes happening now, particularly in terms of this, the, the fast track to adoption of children who are found to have um, poor attachment in their early months, or that there's a family history of, uh, of poor um, parenting. Uh, and really this blame of the individual, the, you know, the, the, the psychology of the family uh, that is at fault, takes away the entire process of, of a society, of social factors, of social class, uh, of, of poverty and all the rest of it, uh, to, to a massive extent. And neuroscience is being used. And I think that anybody in the care field has to make sure they have a, a very healthy scepticism. I have to say that I do promote Stephen's books on some of the courses that I run. Thank um, you. And I want 10% now, but the, <laughs> the, uh, the, the problem with it is that if people don't read it uh, with a, you know, fully, 
with a clarity, then they pick up little um, sort of you know slogans, and therefore the whole problem is is just the, the psychology of the family, the, the psychiatry of the child, and really that is part of the surveillance process. It really is another form of control. And social people in social care have to be very very scared about their role in quasi scientific surveillance. One of my job, my uh, my job, my day job is uh, to do the analysis on um, brain images from PET scans from some of these uh, uh, some of these types of studies. Now, I work in medicine rather than uh, the sort of surveillance or psychiatry, psychiatry type of uh, um, uh, topics. Um, but what you do notice is that, as touched on by the last speaker, is that. When we're looking at trying to find solutions to problems, medical problems, is that we always look at the individual and rather than society. So, for example, we do a lot of studies on um, people with diabetes, on hypoglycemia, um, and we're doing a study at the moment looking at the effects on appetite on people who've had bariatric surgery, which is quite an extreme surgery for people who are uh, classed as obese. But the solutions that the medicine in medical industry wants to focus on is the individual. So it's all about the individual not fitting into society and rather than society fitting around how all of us are on, on our day-to-day -day lives and how society affects us. So that and that goes right all the way back to what Stephen Rose was talking about, ADA, children with ADHD as well. We're not looking at how society affects us um, and how we can change society. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is, because that's part of my day job, I sort of understand what the limitations of all of these things are. So we can get certain bits of information, but whether we can actually read people's minds, um, I'm very sceptical of that. But whether we can literally do that is sort of not really important, because if, if, the, ph if the pharmaceutical companies or DARPA think that they can do it, they will push ahead with this. And just as a little... So sort of note on that, I had a conversation with one of my friends who worked in human resources. She says she was picking up on this little comment that I think she picked up on some training course to do with neuro-linguistic neuro programming. How you can tell if somebody's lying or uh, telling the truth. And it's about which direction they look when they're telling the story. So if you look up to the left, you're looking to the past. If you're looking to the right, that you're uh, trying to fantasise and make make something up. So, although you know it's clearly nonsense, this is affecting uh, your likelihood of getting a job. But when it comes to predicting this stuff, they also, when they try to look at uh, who's going to be the troublemaker, can they predict who's most likely to be violent or most likely to be the criminals? There's a complete bias in the definition of that because they're obviously looking at people they figure don't fit into society, but they don't look at George W. Bush or Bob Diamond, whether he's, whether he's more prone to corruption than um, somebody who, who might break in and steal a TV or something. And also, I think, if they're going to look at paranoia and fantasies, they should probably be analysing the brains of the people who managed art for themselves. <laughs> Um, just a, a, a short comment and a question. Um, I'm a secondary school science teacher, and the way we teach science is quite reductive. Um, and just because we're very prescriptive <coughs> in the curriculum, there's not much space to fit in critical voices or to complicate things and say it's a bit messier than it's presented either in textbooks or in you know popular science articles. Um, but in terms of sort of the voices that are out there in science, at the minute, I mean, apart from obviously the likes of Stephen. Um, the late Stephen Jay Gould, Richard Lewontin, Richard Levins, people like that. It seems to me that there isn't that many critical voices within science. I mean, if you look back historically to the role, say, the National Academy of Sciences in the, in the United States, uh, people like Richard Levins and Richard Lewontin resigned uh, from the National Academy of Sciences because of its role in Cold War research. Um, and a couple of years ago, the National Academy of Sciences was involved in this uh, neural enhancement of soldiers research, this, these super soldiers. You can Google it, there's a New Scientist article about it. But at the minute, it seems like there's not that many critical voices within, within science. Um, people like uh, Sam Harris, the, the neuroscientist, in his latest book, Moral Landscapes, um, he advocates racial profiling, but he also advocates this neural profiling. 
um, based on sort of neural correlates of, of certain behaviours. And I think David Eagleman in his book Incognito also advocates some sort of minority report kind of situation where you can try and predict these criminal behaviours before they actually happen. Um, and my question, Stephen, is just what was the sort of critical voices in science at the minute? Has there been a sea change? Um, actually, I wanted to touch on the subject of the brainwashing and the old techniques. Before the, the technique of neuroimaging, etc., there were techniques to alter people's minds uh, through the process of not post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, but complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, that is the means of uh, putting someone through trauma time and time again to break down the mind and to compartmentalize it so you can reprogram somebody. I think that is one of the aspects you left out in your story because that was a predecessor to the neuro techniques that are used today. And I'd also want to um, get into the subject of why they're developing this right now. <coughs> There is the subject of the abnormal person and the stigmatizing the abnormal person in society, but as well as the thing that people um, trying to change somebody's mind or reading the mind of somebody who's not exactly criminal but just thinking differently is people are, who are prone to insurrection and how to uh, cut down this, this resistance. So if, I'm thinking that these techniques are being developed in a special area of cutting down um, popular uh, uprising, actually. Having like a mass effect of disabling people, of getting what they need <coughs> through means of revolution, for example, or just being simply <coughs> angry and fed up, and just debilitating them immediately. I think that's the main, the main um, purpose of the development of these kinds of techniques. But the, the research that's done before is mapping out the type of brain that's prone to insurrection, for example, and uh, reading them out in advance, or maybe in hindsight. Like uh, with the Egyptian revolutionaries, that the, the mind changes uh, through struggle, and that the patterns and the processes, and there are new networks being formed inside the brain, new neural networks that are much stronger than the fear networks that were developed inside the brain before. And they're trying to figure out a way of uh, neutralizing this effect. That's what I think of this issue. Streetwise, uh, particularly in relation to the earlier question about uh, what can we do, what can we do to uh, to, to disrupt them. Uh, when I joined the Socialist Workers Party uh, decades ago, uh, we were reading pamphlets at that time written by Russian revolutionaries before the Russian Revolution about how you avoided the Okhrana, the Russian secret police, and they were basically saying do some very simple and sensible things. And one of the things that we were taught was you didn't carry around your address book with you. Because if you carried around your address book with you, you could lose it in the pub and it could be picked up by the NF, as it was then. Or if you were arrested by the police, you'd give them the police the address book. Now, why do we all carry our address books around with us? Why do we make life even easier for the police by putting our address books on Facebook and everything else? <laughs> I mean, this is surely very, very basic stuff, and yet we all fall into the trap of doing this. Uh, the reward for not doing that, I think, is quite interestingly illustrated in a story in Malcolm Gladwell's book, uh, Blink, where he describes a war game carried out a decade ago by the American military when they were planning to uh, invade an unnamed Middle Eastern country. And they chose as the bad guy a Vietnamese, an American Vietnam veteran who had extensive combat experience. And the idea in the war game was that he would play the part of the bad guys and they would see how good they were. What he did was fascinating. He immediately suspended all electronic communication. He then attacked the American fleet in the war game using the most lowest techniques of attack that he could. You know, big explosives, but put them in dinghies. By the end of the day in the war game, he had apparently destroyed 16 American ships, including the biggest American uh, aircraft carrier. The American military were horrified by this, 
So they required that the war game be rerun the second day with a new commander who played by the rules. <laughs> I just want to make a point uh, regarding um, sort of like medication use as a form of not dealing with a bigger problem or also a form of control. I work in a residential home and I've noticed that when residents have you know, become more quiet or so, they're visited by the doctor and the doctor just prescribes them, say, 10 milligrams of an antidepressant and that's it. It's not followed up. We don't, it's not like going into why they're feeling depressed at all. So I'm just saying that's a cheap way of dealing with the issue. And another thing I've also noticed is that we had a lady at home who was suffering from quite severe dementia and she was wandering around and walking around and, you know, putting herself in some sort of danger and the way that doctor dealt with this was to just give her a tranquilizer so she'd be sleeping most of the time and I personally thought that was, you know, just terrible to do such a thing and what should have been done is have training in how to um, deal with this sort of thing instead of you know using medication as a way to tranquilize um, this woman. And I just wanted to ask like what sort of um, how can we sort of tackle this issue in a way of like you know, antidepressant medication or antipsychotics using the way of like numbing the mind at a state um, and control. Yeah, so I'll there are far too many good points that have been made, and issues have been made, that I could possibly sort of respond to, except to agree with a large number of things that people said. I wanted to take up a couple of very specific things. Firstly, because one of the most disturbing things I heard was your point that, in fact, your attempt to get the DNA, your own DNA record taken out of the police archives was, was failed. And I think that's something that really ought to be taken up, and if you come and talk to me afterwards, we could discuss how to do that. Um, but I then want to come back to the more general points. Yes, everything that I've described has its precursors and has a long history about it. And we can go right the way back to even before the 1950s to try to do that. I was trying really just to talk about what is happening over the last, where these are moving over the last, over the, the, the last few years in particular. Is a lot of it snake oil? Yes, quite a lot of the claims are indeed snake oil. They are actually hyped. Um, oversold in a very large number of ways. I mean, I'm a, I'm a great believer in brain imaging and the uses of it, but I can't help remembering that a, two years ago, a group of students in an American college managed to get a very good fMRI signal out of a dead salmon. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so you do need to take it with a, with, 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 with a fair pinch of salt. <laughs> so, um, are the claims reductionist? Yes, of course, also they are reductionist. Everything that was said about as well, the multiple effects of dopamine, the many different brain regions that are involved in all of these processes are absolutely right. But the reductionism is intrinsic to the way in which modern science is taught and these research questions are asked. Whoever commented on the critical science, yes, the nature of the way in which science is taught in the universities, the nature of the jobs that we have as scientists, and I can speak more freely as a retired person than I could to as someone who was still trying to run research grants and actually sort of run a lab, is, is, is to be intensely narrow, very focused, and very reductionist. And there are huge problems about it. That reductionism spills over into the way that DARPA thinks now and DARPA thought in the past. Um, just a very classical example of that is that back in the 1970s, some American psychosurgeons proposed they could solve the problem of ghetto riots and revolutionary tendencies by performing a small brain operation and removing the amygdala from the brain of what they call the ghetto ringleaders and the ringleaders of problems in prison. They wrote a book about it, two American psychosurgeons called Mark and Irvin. Um, so there isn't anything new about this sort of reductionism in that sense. Um, so healthy cynicism, yes, the claims are overhyped, but nonetheless the techniques are being used and are going to go on being used. Are the technologies twofold? Yes, they are twofold. Most of these technologies can be in some ways liberatory in the same way as they can actually be oppressive. The um, personal computer, the, uh, the PC, Facebook, uh, all these technologies are potentially liberatory. The fact that you can take your cell phone and you can actually take a picture of the cops beating someone up seems to me to be a way of turning the technologies back on the authorities rather than the other way around. So that's a form, if you like, of, of the way in which the technologies are actually um, twofold. Is the, is the are the technologies um, 
invincible, um, point made by the very first speaker and just now about low technology. We're living in a world of what's called asymmetric warfare, in which you get these monstrously high-tech forces ranged against very simple technologies. IEDs are rather simple technologies. Back in the days of the Vietnam War, um, when the Americans thought they could disrupt the trail of um, equipment going down the what's called the Ho Chi Minh Trail from North Vietnam to the South by using heat sensing missiles. The Vietnamese solved the problem by hanging up buckets of piss in the trees and missiles in the trees. So, yes, there are these technologies and these reversal technologies that you can use, and we should never forget that they are. Someone asked about music and noise. I seem to remember that some of the big supermarket malls have tried to keep um, kids out by playing Mozart. So that's what <laughs> uh, On some of the, 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 the other issues, neuromarketing. Yes, I was talking mainly about the military and control stuff, but of course the, um, the, the potential of um, measuring neuro symbols in this, uh, in this sort of way is certainly there for the marketing agencies. I, a few years ago, published an account in which I was trying to measure the brain processes going on when people were going through what I call the virtual supermarket. They sat in a machine and were taken on a tour of Sainsbury's. And we were, I was interested in memory and what they wanted to, what, what their favourite products were and what they wanted to buy. I won't go into the details of the experiment, but when we published it, I was inundated with invitations from advertising and marketing agencies to go and tell them how to advertise and market their properties differently and better. So yes, that is an expanding area. I think it's probably as much snake oil as anything else. I'm sure you can get as much from taking a, if you insist on testing how your ads or your products work without actually trying to understand what's going inside, on inside the brain. So, um, the, the, the technologies are there, the snake oil is there, but the real issues, I think, of surveillance, of the increasing power of the state to, um, to attempt to regulate, to control, to manipulate, um, and above all, to read our thoughts and intentions and plan, plot and plan and direct and understand what's going on in every cranny of the state. It's what, back in the... Um, early 19th century, the guy whose stuffed body is in the UC um, foyer over there, Jeremy Bentham, called a panopticon. The state now wants to actually have a panopticon. It's a panopticon which includes DNA and it includes brain images as well. We need to be worried about it. One last point, a very interesting question about sort of hair nuts, hair nuts for infants and informed consent. Um, the medical profession has attempted, and the research profession and the bioethicists, to regulate what is done in medical research and in experiments and so on by having people sign forms for informed consent, which are supposed to actually say what you can use this particular research for and what you can't. In the days of DNA, in the days of data mining, in the days of the health service records and the availability that there is there, Informed consent is unfortunately a broken concept and we don't yet know how and what to do in order to try to reconstruct the control that we can have as individuals and as civil society over what they do, whether it's big pharma, the state, the military or the police, with bits of our bodies and bits of our minds. And that's a problem that we confront. <laughs>